Hello, welcome Team ET. Another wonderful week. Metaphorically, I'm sitting here, the sun shining, the birds singing. This week, my family, well, mainly my daughter actually, um, began her countdown to the date for erecting the famous Christmas tree. So as this show or this episode will go to air, we're just a few days away from the beginning of December 2023. And um, for us, at least, that's when we when we put up the Christmas tree. So my daughter is getting quite excited about it. So that's what the, the talk in the house has been about. Um, in between business meetings, program development, we managed to squeeze in a parent-teacher meeting, which is always fun. And I don't know about you, but I always feel the chairs are getting that little bit smaller each time I go in the room. So anyway, never fails to bring back many memories. All right, so enough of my rambling. This week, you heard in the intro, we're joined by Mr. Jim Bishop, founder of Conjunction Leadership. Jim, great to have this opportunity to connect. And we're going to chat about what I know many of our listeners will probably find interesting, and that's the fact that work doesn't have to suck out all of our energy and leave us with very little left in the tank for relationships and family, etc. So, Jim Bishop, welcome to the ET Project. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. What does, I mentioned Christmas. I'm, I'm wondering, what does Christmas or the festive season look like in your family? Is it a big occasion? Everyone comes together or how do you? Oh, yeah. We have uh, we have five kids in our household. So it's always a very festive time. Lots of activity, lots of busyness. Um, we generally try and incorporate that with some travel too, um, just right. leisure travel. We go visit family, of course, for some of the celebrations, but this year we'll be heading down to the Caribbean for a little bit just to enjoy some warmer weather and um, nice. ideally some clearer water. So, Yeah. We were just talking before I hit record about um, you just came back from, from a, a little time away and I was wondering whether you get up to Michigan to the lake very often, but it seems not so much, I guess. Yeah, we've gone up there occasionally when our kids were little. It was a much closer trip to go to Lake Michigan than it was to go to the ocean, and they couldn't see the other side, and they thought it was the same. So um, much much uh, quicker and much cheaper. So, uh, Very good. And <clears throat> reading, reading your bio, I see that you're a supporter of the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, I may not pronounce that first word correctly, but what is this, Jim? This is a, a group of blacksmiths, or, or what is it? Correct, yeah. Um, Purdue is a university based in West Lafayette, Indiana. It happens to be my alma mater, and it happens to be where my two youngest children, or my two oldest children are going currently. Right. Um, my wife also graduated from there, as did all of our siblings and their spouses. So it's a little bit of a family legacy. But as I was saying, the, the Boilermakers got their name because there, there is a train a line that runs through uh, where the campus is near. And okay. the first football team that they put together was um, uh, a lot of the members of the football team came from the the men working on the train line and they beat a local team that was favored to win. And in the newspaper article that surrounded that, that defeat, um, the newspaper article disparagingly called the team, the Purdue Boilermakers and that they had beat the, the, um, their rival. And since then the name stuck. So it is, it has a lot of train memorabilia. Our mascot is a, uh, called the Boilermaker Special, which is a train. Boilermaker Pete carries a hammer as if he was working on the train line. So, uh, Very nice. Very, very historical and uh, I'm sure very inspirational. If, if I'm correct, you stepped away in 2020 from the corporate life. Uh, is that around about that time? We're, we're correct. Going to dive, we'll, we'll dive into this uh, in more detail about what you're doing now and you know, what you've been doing since then. But I wonder just for the listeners whether you'd mind um, outlining your career journey as much as you as you care to, um, which I, I guess spanned from what I read about you 25 years or so. So I wonder if you'd mind just outlining a little bit of that. Sure, absolutely. Um, so today I work as an executive coach, but I need to start where the, the journey started. I'm actually yeah. classically trained as a scientist. And my education is in um, physiology and behavior. And I, for a long while, I, or I worked in science, more technical consulting, if you will. 
Um, and what that was, was working with our clients to help them Im implement our solutions. But most of the time they were asking me questions that had nothing to do with the science. It was mostly around people. And through that journey, I started recognizing I actually had aptitude and knack for this. And I loved learning more and more about it. So I just kept following that journey. Um, it took me to work the majority of my career in life sciences and pharmaceutical development, both in human health and animal health. And in that journey, uh, most of my experience was around leadership development, executive development, um, talent management, succession management, and then eventually moved into the world of executive development and coaching. And so it was in 2020, I had, um, oh, actually 2017, I pursued my executive coaching certification. I started collecting some clients pro bono on the outside, as well as doing coaching on the inside. Um, and then in 2020, the world was just in a massive state of chaos. People were moving all over the place, um, trying to decide what this thing called life was about and how they wanted to work it. And then there were many executives trying to scratch their head, thinking just what just happened and how do we incorporate all of the remote work environment situations, as well as all the social uh, unrest and social situations that were percolating. Yeah. And I just started seeing that many executives weren't able to make that adaption very easily. And so... Uh, it was at that point in time, I realized my best gift was going to be realized on the outside of an organization when I was more neutral and I had more um, um, distance between me and my clients. They could trust me better and they were going to drop into their own story and their own authenticity a little better. So 2020 Conjunction Leadership was officially born. And today I work um, primarily in executive coaching. I do a fair bit of team development with those individuals that I work with. And ultimately um, we work in the culture space too, to innovate, how do we work together differently? So, and much as you said in the beginning of it, my whole mission and purpose is to make sure that work doesn't suck anymore for people. And we start with a leader, one person at a time who wants to be courageous in that journey, then take their team along in that journey with them. And ultimately we start behaving differently. And that's what we call culture, so. Very nice. We'll, we'll dig more into that as we go through the discussion. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, it's, I know you traveled around the world and there were times where you felt you were burning out too much uh, travel, too much work, too many tasks. I, I'm just wondering if, if you reflect back over that career, um, and I like to ask this to a lot of people, so I'm not just picking on your career, but was there one major highlight, maybe there's multiple, but if you could think of one of the biggest highlights during your career that really stands out to you, a positive highlight. Yeah, I, I mean, every every um, every situation has a silver lining, right? And so uh, my journey is actually conjunction leadership's journey. I mean, I think a lot of founders find it that way, that they bring some of their mess into the world, and that's ultimately their message. But you know, there was a point in time I was climbing the corporate ladder, if you will. I seemingly had what I wanted in front of me. Um, I had the sponsorship and the the advisors and all the right people helping me figure out what to do next. Um, I had taken um, a slight left turn out of this people world <clears throat> as we were buying and merging a lot of different companies at the time. And my role became a sales director at that point in time, a national sales director. And it was, it was um, a slight deviation from being in the direct side of working with people, but the main purpose was so that we could bring competitive organizations together and build culture in it. I found a tremendous amount of satisfaction and also a tremendous amount of success in that. I mean, we had record sales, our team engagement scores were super high. All the metrics that you would look for were there. And it was it was at that moment when I realized, I mean, on the personal side, we also had number four, child number four and child number five. Um, it was a very busy time in our family life, and I found myself traveling on the road almost all the time, visiting clients, working with my sales teams, keeping the numbers going. And in the back of my mind, I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing because I was here to provide. I, I needed to provide for my family. And as long as there was a runway in front of me and my career had success, I felt like I was doing my role as provider. But there was a, there was a point in time, I remember going to bed late one evening after a really busy day on the road in my hotel room and just feeling that that pit in my stomach of being ultimately alone and wondering, is this really getting me where I want to be? And it was in those kind of quiet moments of reflection when I realized my, my personality and my being was more than just being a provider. It was also going more into the world of, of um, 
making sure that I was I was authoring the future I wanted instead of just reacting to the world around me and reacting to the the advice that other people gave me and you should do this or you should do this and if you do this then this is what comes next and all of that was great advice if I wanted to be them but I felt like I was following a path that wasn't necessarily my path right. and I started having to put together how do I how do I work in this world of business and in this world of people um, how do I combine my family and my love of agriculture? How do I make sure that my family and my work get to be working together? And, and ultimately, how do I bring my kids even into my business a little bit, right? So there were a lot of these, what I would call tensions that I was trying to put together. And I just couldn't quite make them fit because the path that everybody was recommending to me was a was a different path. It wasn't that path. But when I started creating it in my own and realizing I can take these two things together. And if I put an or between there, it's either my family or my job, or it's my work or my love of agriculture. Um, and I, I started realizing I could change the conjunction and I could change the sentence. So if I said my work and my family and business and this, this world of people and executive development and agriculture, I could start putting all those things together in a sentence that made sense for me. But that was where I was standing at the edge of my courage, because that's where the path ended for many other people. There weren't many others who have followed the path that I was about ready to take. And so what I stood for at that point in time was authoring your future based upon the conjunctions you choose. And that's still what I stand for today when I work with my executives. Um, so many of them are, are in a space um, both in their business and in their life that very few people have followed before them. And so there's not a lot of places they can get advice. And ultimately, my job as a coach is not to give them advice. It's to help them hold those disparate tensions that they really want and figure out how do they put the and between it? And then what is the corollary and corresponding sentences that they need to fill in to be courageous enough to make it happen? So. Right. And, and thank you. That answered one of the questions I had for you about conjunction leadership and, and the, the forming of that name where it came from, but now I understand. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah. If, you look, if you look back at the corporate life compared to where you are now, is there anything that you miss from the corporate world? You wish, gosh, I wish I could be still doing that. Yeah, there's a lot of great things. I mean, corporate America had a lot to offer, right? It One, it was... Um, <laughs> I'm going to say I missed the steady paycheck for sure, right? Now when you're out hustling and trying to figure out your client base and also take yeah. care of all the, the book work and the accounting as well as doing your client-facing work, there's there's both of those things. But more broadly, I, I really miss the team part of it. I mean, in corporate America, we have the chance to really put together some of the best teams. Um, as you As we all know, sometimes some of the worst teams also exist. And then we get sucked in with bad meetings and bad everything to try and make it all happen. So I have to believe that, you know, there there is a way and I have been on some very, very successful teams. And I do think that that's ultimately one of my strengths in helping executives uh, manage some of the more pro-social skills of putting teams together rather than just looking at their their um, subject matter expertise or the role that they play. Mm. And when you get the right combination of the team, it certainly is more than the sum of its parts. If you have a leader who doesn't know how to manage a team and if or they put together a team of people of experts then you get kind of, you may get less than the sum of its parts, right? You may get a bunch of experts who don't necessarily know how to play together and they all want to win individually rather than win collectively. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of collective team intelligence piece that I look for and how I work. But I think that's that's what I probably miss the most of corporate America is just seeing when that works and then watching the enthusiasm of a team and a leader who just get it and go set on fire. So mm -hmm. have, have you done any team coaching um training or study yourself or is it more from the leadership working with teams and and understanding how to lead teams that you you leverage yeah um so back to the business model a little bit right like for many years the 25 years plus prior in corporate america i i worked in more of like what i would call the development capacity where we were putting together programs and putting people in classroom situations and or providing them with tools and templates and worksheets to help them help their job work better. Talent, mm -hmm. talent guides or interview questions or those kind of things. And all of those programmatic pieces work up into a, a point. Um, what I would see is people would come to the program. They might have an epiphany or a mind shift. 
And then they would go home and the environment didn't really change. The people mm-hmm. around them didn't change. The leadership didn't change. And so they felt like I learned something, but it doesn't really fit. And it's too hard for me as an in of one to try and make this shift in the culture. Yes. Um, and so I would get constantly frustrated that we would do our best job in the classroom and then something would happen back in the job and it would all go away. And in three months time, nothing was happening with what we had helped them with. So now back to why did I choose the way that I choose? I, I mean, I, I ultimately we could work in culture and I get a lot of calls today from HR reps who say, I've been assigned our culture project. Can we help with that? Um, and what they're really talking about is more like the mission, vision, values type of stuff where they sit in a room and then they wordsmith it to death and they take hours and hours trying to debate whether this word is going to make more sense than that word. And ultimately what they get is the most neutral language possible because that's what everybody agrees to. They slap it on a brass plaque and they put it beside the door and they say, this is, this is who we are. And then people walk past it every day and go, well, I see what you say, but that's not how actually we behave. Right. And ultimately every company has honesty, integrity, and trust somewhere buried in their values. Right. But how do we exemplify those? It would, it would start wearing on me. So what I decided to do was what I noticed in those classroom situations was inevitably one or two individuals would come up afterwards. And they would ask for something else. They would ask for, you know, help me figure this out. And we would sit in the one-on-one and we would be very courageous about figuring out what needs to change and how do they make a difference for their team. So when I started this thing, I said, well, we're not going to go to the end of the question yet. I mean, yes, we want to make work suck less, but we got to do that first one leader at a time. And we got to help the leader get comfortable with what it means to lead in this different environment, what has changed, what hasn't. They're going to have to disrupt many of the things they already know about themselves and about leadership to learn to lead differently. They're going to have to bridge, by, meaning setting new goals and where they want to be. And then they're going to ultimately have to grow into it. So in my coaching, we work on that disrupt, bridge and growth model so that when they get to that growth stage, then we start bringing their team in. We start bringing in the team coaching and the team development and some of the workshops and some of the classroom situations to give them the common language to support that leader and that leader to be able to support them. And then when we do that, what I find is the common language and the common process makes a bigger, stronger, common culture. And then it comes really easy as to what are we going to put on our mission, vision, values, and brass plaques, because we're already speaking a similar language. We don't have to argue about what's the meaning of this certain word. So for me, it always starts with a leader, then it goes to the team, and then it goes to the culture in that order, almost specifically. So how does that challenge show up in the first place? that the leader or the company realizes that they need to seek somebody like you to come in and work with them. Like, Where does it come from? Like, I'm just curious how that materializes. Yeah. Um, I think what we've seen over the last three or four years is a pretty seismic shift in the coaching space, right? Like coaching generally in the executive space had a feeling of I'm being punished if I have to have a coach. Like high performers don't need a coach, right? But yet in sports, we never question whether or not the athletes at the top of their game have some of the most nutrition coaches and fitness coaches and all kinds of coaches working with them, right? But in corporate America, there was this stigma. But I think what happened post-pandemic, post-social unrest, post-everything that we've been experiencing the last three years is a lot of leaders realized something had changed and they didn't. They were so busy controlling and optimizing and planning about how to keep the business running, how to keep people in their jobs, how to not have downsizing or downturns. And they were running the same play over and over and over again. And what they didn't do was stop to reflect about what part of me has to change. So now two, three years post, what we're seeing is a lot of people running around with pretty drained batteries. And so the way that people find me is often because they're, they're using words like, I feel stuck. I feel depleted. Maybe maybe even on the more courageous side, if they're more in tune with what's going on inside of them, some of them are starting to say like, I think there's more, but I'm sitting at the top of the pyramid. I'm not sure there is more. Like, I don't know what more looks like because I can't grow in my career anymore. And they're thinking of it in terms of job levels. Mm-hmm. When they come to me, they're, they feel stuck because they don't know if they need to go be a CEO of a bigger company or... When we get back into it, a lot of it is I just need to grow and learn some things differently. And when I do, I'm putting myself back into my center of power. I'm putting myself back into that space of authoring my future. I'm playing offense versus defense. And when they do that, they're realizing that's what growth looks like. It's not because I go higher in the org charter, I get more salary. Mm. Um, So 
I find it, it's kind of a, a weird combination of how people find me and where they're at when they come. But most of them are in that spot of feeling like, hmm, there has to be a little bit more, but I'm not sure what that looks like. And do I recall correctly, um, your focus is mainly on men within your organization, within your practice? Yeah, um, I, I'm not opposed to having female clients, and I do have some. I just, it, it turned out that way. I didn't niche it specifically to begin with. It just turned out the people who resonate with my story the most happen to be men, mostly between the ages of 37 and 50, 55. Yep. Um, something happens right around that spot in their career when they realize my discretionary time isn't the same as I used to have. I have more responsibility. I've continued to grow in my life. I've continued to grow in my job. I'd love to be giving back to my community some. I just don't have the energy or the time to do that. And when they get to that spot, they're they're really wrestling with, I can't work harder and I can't optimize this anymore. And work-life balance doesn't really seem like a, a thing. So how do I make that fit where all of me comes to all of the situations where I want it to be versus just part of me coming to my job and the rest of it, I go home at night and feel really tired and burned out. So, yeah. Uh, look, so I do, uh, I do have other clients that are females. Um, I don't, I, we work together well, but the majority of people that I work with tend to be midlife men, ex male executives. So. Yeah, very, very good. I, I can certainly uh, relate to what you're talking about and being on a similar path. So um, I could have used your coaching during my career for sure. I, I'd like to go back just a step and talk more about the disrupt bridge grow um I don't know whether you refer to it as a tagline or uh, it, it's really the principles of your business, I guess. So could we dissect each one of those a little bit deeper than what you did uh, previously, if you don't mind? Sure, sure. Less than a tagline. I mean, it, I use it in branding, of course, but it's more of a mile marker for my my clients as we go through the coaching journey. Yeah. Um, you know, many of them, as I mentioned, are midlife. So it didn't. they didn't just get to the spot by two or three years in their career. They, they have a lot of life history. Yeah. And through that life history, they've also gained some sort of identity with that, right? There are many ways that we've learned to show up with the rules or the boundaries around us. Some of us use our powers of relationship. Some of us use our powers of intellect. Others of us use our powers of um, being able to control and plan and optimize and just our sheer will, right? And those are good gifts up into a point. If we continue to use those gifts over reactively, then what can happen is we can burn our batteries out. But those gifts have given us an identity. They have given me the nice guy persona, or they have given me the intellectual persona, or they have given me the, the, the get shit done kind of persona, if we want to use that language. And so when people have that belief in the back of their mind, then all of their behaviors follow through with that. So in the disruption phase, what we're really trying to do is several things. One is help them understand what is the storyline that's running through their head and how do they see themselves? What is the, the persona that they have naturally adopted that they may not even be consciously aware of anymore? Um, what are some of those lessons that they have learned throughout their life and throughout their journey, like the highs and the lows? Both of them have taught them something. We crystallize out of that some of their core values of how what are the, the, the values that are operating subsurface and this identity piece and how do those link together? And then we start looking at all the things that they have learned to do in that. And they'll they'll use phrases like always or never, some of these superlatives. And that tells me that there's a belief system operating there. So we start dismantling some of those beliefs. It's, it's in that disruption phase that they find it like the world really feels like the, the bottom has fallen on out or it's shifting around, right? It's not very stable because they're in that space of becoming something new, but mm. we're not naturally hardwired as humans to accept change. So when that feels shifting, they just want to hold on. And that's when they overuse those gifts and those identities that they've heard. What we can do then is help them bridge. And that comes to our, once they get to that spot, we start bridging towards what does the future look like? What do you want it to be? What do you, what would you be doing in a year from now that would make you feel like you're more on offense and less on defense? Mm. Um, we set some of those visions and those goals and those identity statements and who they want to be. And then you know, some people will affectionately say in the growth phase, they feel like they're faking it till they make it. But that's that's truly not it. What we've done is we've put the, the vision out there of where they want to be. And in the growth phase, what I'm doing is just reflecting whether or not their current behaviors are getting them closer to where they want to be or not. Um, 
the, the old self still wants to resurrect itself during that growth journey. And it still wants to come up and over control the situation or over subordinate when it comes to conflict, depending on it. And what my job is, is to hold them accountable towards what they said they wanted to become during that phase so that they have a, a period of time to practice. Mm. So if we look at generally a year long engagement in coaching, we break it down pretty much the first three months are in the disrupt phase. Maybe the next month or two is in the bridging phase. And then beyond that, we spend the rest of our time just growing and growing and growing. And usually by the time a year comes around, um, what they realize is I don't want to leave. I don't want the guardrails to come off because I don't trust myself yet. So we just continue the growth phase as long as they want to. So, And, and what do you do in the growth phase? Like you, you're creating new habits. You're, you're looking at new directions. What does that entail? Yeah. If you think of it kind of like a, a teeter totter, probably the first part of our relationship, the disrupt in the bridge phase, it's, it's not entirely led by me, but I will ask more of the questions and lead the conversation. Once we get to the growth phase, the teeter-totter tips a little bit in their favor, and they're bringing me their situations of work or their situations of life. And they set their intention for our call. They'll they'll show up and say, this is what I want to work on today. This is what a successful outcome looks like for me today. I need you to reflect this or this. I need you to mm -hmm. hear this or this. Um, and it it is less of me knowing anything about their job and more about how are they showing up in these momentary conversations called leadership? Are they are they being consistent with who they said they wanted to be in this new place? Or are they is the old self coming up? So that that growth phase is really where they're actioning towards their biggest and most important goals, who they are and who they want to be, both personally and professionally. So Ooh. most of our relationships start off on the professional side with some aspirations they want to get done in their business. And what they realize is the business stuff is actually pretty easy. It's me being me in my yeah. life that maybe I need to take more responsibility of because in, in business, there's a lot of other people to keep me accountable towards the income statement or our growth plans or our profitability targets. In my life, it's just me to keep me accountable. And so they want to become a better person, not just a better executive. So. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting field, and, and I like the structure very much. If I was to challenge you on your own business now and say, if we applied the disrupt, bridge, grow methodology, and, and you look back over the three years, um, looking to the future, the bridge, the grow, what's on the horizon for you? Is there a change, a shift? Are you comfortable with the direction you're heading with everything? Uh, what, what does it look like? Yeah, uh, well, just as we were talking there before the intro a little bit, I just came back. I, once a year, I try to go away on a little solo retreat. Um, nowhere elaborate, just a small cabin. It doesn't even have to have Wi-Fi or internet. What, what I do is I just get out and clear my head, eat good food, walk, um, get some ideas, sit in the sun for a little bit, notice nature's beauty. All of those kind of things speak to me, but it gives me a chance then to kind of think through what do, what does next year look like or what does five years from now look like? Yeah. And that's my time to start looking at myself and saying, what do I need to do to be able to hold more space or to be more bold for my clients? Mm -hmm. um, I would I would say the biggest shift is from when I started to where I'm at now. And the thing that I will intend to do even more in the future is just be more bold with my clients. And what I mean by that is sometimes, you know, they're they're a client, they're paying you. And for me, there was a, a, originally some of the old self was resurrecting itself, wanting to be the nice guy and the pleaser and making sure that 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 would earn more income, if you will, that they would continue to pay me. What I realized was, though, that's not serving my clients very well, because if they just wanted someone to be nice to them, they could just go find that in their work. There are yep. plenty of people around them right now that subordinate to their power structure and say, well, you're the CEO. I'm not. So I'll listen to whatever you say. In this relationship, I really have to bring my best self to it. And I have to listen and understand, but not necessarily agree all the time. And they'll they'll want to hold on to that old self so hard because it's it's very, very difficult to shift an identity, right? Yes. Um, and what I need to be able to do is just reflect what I hear happening. And so I'll give you a quick example. I had an executive two weeks ago um, that that pursued a 360 evaluation, if you will. They got some feedback back from their team and the feedback was good. And part of the critique though, was sometimes they feel like this guy was moving way too quickly and way too fast. And they never, he didn't take the oppression that he was listening to a lot of people's opinions. Hmm. And so 
he got that feedback and then he immediately called me and wanted to go through it line by line and understand who said what and where did it come from because he wanted to be able to go and correct all of those behaviors. And the manner in which he was asking me the questions were so rapid fire, he was moving so quickly that I could tell he wasn't truly digesting the feedback, right? And it was, the irony was, the feedback was, you don't listen to other people's opinions very well and you move very quickly. And yes. he was showing that same behavior to me. And in a moment of courage, I could have, I could have just sat there and said, well, what do you want to do with this? And asked him some of the quote unquote, great coaching questions. Instead, I just kind of held the mirror up a little bit. And I said, are you open to a reflection? Because here's the reflection that I'm seeing is the same behavior that they have given you feedback on is the same behavior you're displaying with me. And if you're showing it to me, I can understand now how they're perceiving this in their feedback. And all of our coaching sessions are recorded. So I just forwarded him the recording of our coaching session. And I said, I just would invite you to watch this. It's in that moment when I run the risk of losing a client, right? I run okay. the risk of pushing them away. But more times than not, these people don't have someone that pushes them in that way. That doesn't push them to get better as they want to get better. They put, you know, many people in business just push the leader to be a better business leader and make sure the income statement looks good but they don't necessarily push them to be a better human. And I realized that that's the piece that I can bring to this conversation and where I wanna grow. So some of the other things that'll probably be happening here in the near future, we're putting books together and doing more podcasts and more of those kind of things to get content out there for leaders that they can listen to or learn from rather than always having to be on the other side of a Zoom call, so. Yeah, uh, I'll come back to the book in a moment because I wanna talk a little bit more about books, but. Um, I'm wondering in the reflections, was there was there any thinking about AI and the role of AI now in the future within your organization, within the executive coaching space? What impact do you foresee that it may have, may not have? Yeah, I mean, I, I have clients today who find tremendous impact from AI situations, right? There were particularly like, you know, I'm recording all of our calls. Um, AI will summarize those calls for them. It even timestamps where the, the moments are in the call when I want to bookmark it for him. What they can do is they go back and they cut that transcript out and throw it into a chat GPT or to an AI tool somehow and say, what are three or four remedies to this situation? Or how? what would three or four different responses be to this, this prompt, right? And it gives them, it may not be the verbatims that they go back out and repeat, but what it does is help them see that there is another way of pivoting that conversation to something that's more centered on the other person or more centered on the personal side rather than the professional side. Um, I've added, I've, I've encouraged some of my clients to kind of put their biographies together, if you will, or maybe little bio sheets and feed that through an AI tool and say, make this more personal. You know, yeah. we, we want to toot our own horn and write our own resume and that's pretty easy, but it's chronological and it's dry. Most of our employees don't really want to read something that's dry about us. They want to know some of the personal facts. They want to know, like, who are we as a person and how do we show up? Mm -hmm. And so AI has all, all kinds of solutions, I think, but we're just beginning to tap the potential of what it means in coaching. So. Yeah, sure. I'm also led to believe that you're an avid uh, reader. You like to digest one or two books every chance you get. What, what type yeah. of do you like? Like, what, what sort of books? Um, I like all kinds. I love to learn from other people. So biographies or autobiographies are really important. Um, but I also am a big student on kind of, because I'm trained as a scientist and because behavior is a thing, I love to learn how the brain works. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of neuro books on neuro leadership or uh, neurochemistry, understanding the difference between dopamine and serotonin as an example, and how do we help our help our executives get into a a lower brainwave state. So they're not mm -hmm. so reactive all the time and they can reap the advantage of a serotonin high rather than a dopamine hit. Um, just little things like that to me are, are fascinating. Um, I love to read productivity hacks from other team, other people and if they've come up with something. And then I'm, I'm, I love keeping my craft owned. So I read a ton of stuff on coaching or um, social psychology. Um, mm -hmm. those kind of textbooks or kind of background books. So, so <clears throat> as, as you were developing your coaching, as you've been going through your, your career, has there been influences in your, in your life, like mentors, coaches, advisors, 
people that you've followed that have had an influence on the direction you've gone, the interest you've grown? Oh, absolutely. I mean, even back in my, you know, when I was telling you, I took the path into sales management for a little while. Um, the, the the commercial directors that were putting hiring me for those roles, mm -hmm. the, the words that they would speak over me and to me about the, the reason that I was being brought into the role were because of my coaching ability or because my ability to work and build teams and work with people. Mm -hmm. um, they knew I could learn how to manage a sales book and how to make clients and how, how to work with, you know, all the mechanics of running a business. Um, right. That was all stuff that I didn't necessarily quote unquote grow up with in the business, but learning how to work with people. I, what I knew was I needed to draw upon the collective of my team to make sure that we got all those tasks done and mm -hmm. it built the team rather than building an individual leader. I would say those were pivotal moments because in that time when I'm sitting in that hotel room questioning, is this going where I wanted to go? What I could see was the further I followed what the path of what I should be doing, um, according to other people, the further away I was going to get from who I was as a person. And those two things were, that was the fork in the road moment for me. And I realized those, the people that were around me recognized these gifts and I needed to figure out a way then to commercialize those gifts. Mm -hmm. um, corporate America for all of its good, sometimes doesn't put the role of people development or HR development or organizational development at the same level as they put commercial development, right? So um, even the CHRO in most organizations still has to ask permission from everyone else before they implement something, right? They're still getting permission on it from the rest of the team to say, is it time for us to do DEI training? Or is it time for us to change our performance planning process? And the CHRO doesn't usually have the same seat at the table, even if they are at the table. Um, and so I recognized the further I went inside of corporate America might be more limited for me. One, I'm, I'm more boundary because I'm speaking corporate language and I'm living only in one corporate philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and two, I just didn't see a career potential there as much. So for me, going outside, starting this on my own, I can be industry agnostic, I can be culture sure. agnostic, I can be client agnostic. And what that gives me is this kind of um, neutrality for people to be able to trust me a little bit better in that journey. So sure. those mentors in that journey were precipitously helpful, leaving corporate America, if you will, shedding that identity, getting rid of it. But I've had some tremendous coaching mentors along the way too. And one very, very dear friend today still, when I'm stuck or feeling like I need to think differently, I pick up the phone and she's there all the time just to help ideate. But it was her, that one individual sitting beside her at an event and she was coaching me, but didn't know, I didn't know I was being coached at the time. And she was asking me those questions. What would I be doing if I wasn't working in corporate America? And I just started spouting out my vision and my dream. And she mm. started helping me put little steps in place to make it happen. And it wasn't with the intention of leaving corporate America, but that's where it ended up happening. So it's a great story. Is that the the theme or the underlying um intent within the book that you're thinking about writing? Uh no, I, I think it's much more around um. So I'll use this analogy, like, you know, when we raise young children and you take your children to the pediatrician, the pediatrician is always helping you understand maybe what the next stage is going to look like, right? This is what's going to happen next time, or we're going to need to do this or treat them this way next time, or here's some developmental milestones that they should be the hearing, right? What we don't have is that same thing for midlife executives or midlife leaders, right? You hit midlife and a lot of people start recognizing things have shifted for them. <laughs> Maybe the value of relationships is something that's more important to them. And they realize the first part of my life so far, I've sacrificed that because I've driven so hard for my career. Um, maybe it's family. And they realize I've kind of, my kids are launching now and they're starting to leave for college and they don't need me, but I still need them. And I don't know how to give that up because I'm always traveling or I'm always working. And so I think the premise of the book much more is kind of, I wouldn't say, call it a roadmap necessarily, but just what are some of those fundamental shifts that midlife executives experience and what are some of the remedies to those shifts and helping move through it? Um, I can just say emotional, emotional understanding for our most male executives is a really big shift because they mm. start feeling a lot of things, but they don't understand what they're feeling because they only have, they have a very limited range of emotion that they can describe. They've let themselves be pretty, 
stoic and boundary most of their career. And now all of a sudden, when my kids are shifting and leaving for college, I, I don't know how to handle that emotion. And I try to downregulate it. And when I downregulate it, it shows up in everything else I do back on the job. And so they they don't make that connection between how I'm reacting to something that I can't name. Mm. So I think that that will be a huge part of the, uh, at least maybe one of the first couple chapters in the book. So Sounds like a very interesting book. What Do you have a, um, a plan or a timeline that you're, you're thinking about for the book? We're just in early stages of working and figuring out what the what the map looks like and then right. publishing and all that kind of stuff. So words have been written, but they have not been organized. I'll put it that way. So <laughs> well, I definitely want to keep keep a close eye out for it. It sounds like a great read. Jim, we're getting close to the to the wrap up and um always ask, of course, where where can people connect with you or follow you? What's the best place to find you? Sure. The most real up-to-date kind of content is going to be found on LinkedIn. Just that Conjunction Leadership is my business page or um, Jim Bishop, James D. Bishop on um, LinkedIn. You can find me there and that's where I'm most active. Um, my website has good information and some downloadable things on it as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's some of these podcast archives around there if you'd like to learn a little bit more about some of the things I've talked about. But that's just at conjunctionleadership.com. Um, and so those are the two primary places today. Um, All right. rest of the socials, not real active on the rest of the socials yet. Um, my main client base just generally doesn't hang out on Facebook or Instagram all that much yet. So yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll put links in the show notes. Final question, if I may, um, any parting words of wisdom to share with the global leaders, you know, most likely based on the conversation, there's going to be many, many leaders out there experiencing a lot of the same of what you and I experienced in our careers, they're caught up with this reactive mode instead of realizing their um, potential and, and their creative potential, I should say, I guess. Um, any any words of wisdom you would leave with them? Yeah, and the, the word of wisdom is to pay attention to it, right? Um, that Those things that you are feeling is... They're warning lights, if you will. And if your mm. car dashboard warning light goes off, you can continue to drive with it for a little while, but eventually the mechanic probably is going to need to look at it and figure out what to do. Um, in our own life and our own way of leading, those warning lights are consistently going off for us. Sometimes it feels like in the quiet of the night when I'm you know, quieting my brain, something yes. pops in and yep. I just can't get over it. Or it might be even worse than that, where fatigue or even tension sets in and maybe your your physical body starts aching more than it used to. Um, if you don't pay attention to those things, it will eventually catch up. And what you're hoping is no one will see that. No one around you will understand that. And you'll just be able to be smart enough or strong enough to work yourself through it. Um, and unfortunately, many of us aren't. That's our protective mechanisms coming into place. What what needs to happen is it, once you talk about it, once you experience it with someone else, especially somebody else who may have gone through that journey, what you realize is it's really not that uncommon for people to be feeling that way. And the wake up call could be to your best future yet. It could be those warning lights are trying to guide you into your most authentic leadership that you could ever possibly imagine. But when we feel a shift going on, what we tend to do is hold on, react to holding on and making sure that it doesn't get away from us instead of leaning in and letting the messy pieces start reorganizing themselves back into something that's better than it was to begin with. Mm. Um, and I feel like that's the value of a coaching relationship. I mean, maybe at sometimes counseling might be appropriate depending on what's showing up in your life, but most executives are probably are ready to look into the future and are ready, ready to go. In a coaching space, what they need to do is just help understand what has been disrupted, what needs to be disrupted, what needs to be bridged, and where do we need to grow? And once we do that, they're really good to go. Yeah. Great advice. Um, I, I loved our conversation, Jim. It's, it's given me a lot of clarity around different things that, that I've experienced over my career and uh, continue to experience. So thank you for that. Wonderful to have you on the ET Project. Uh, look forward to continuing the connection and uh, seeing where where uh, conjunction leadership lands in, in the years ahead. So thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure too. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.